Well, on with our program. In the mid-60s, a young couple stood in the red hills of Dundee, Oregon, with that hopeful, invincible glow of someone embarking on a new adventure. In a wheelbarrow in front of them was their dream, a bundle of strange-looking sticks. The couple was David and Diana Lett, Yamhill County's first wine grape growers since the early part of the century, and founders of the Irie Vineyard. David Lett is here today to share with us some of the history and development of the premium Oregon wine industry, an industry that has produced wines that rival the great Burgundies of France. David graduated from the University of Utah with a degree in philosophy and an eye on a career in the medical field. However, on his way to an admissions interview for dental school in San Francisco, snow in the Donner Pass forced him to take a detour through Napa Valley. <laughs> that detour also changed David's career choice. And rather than de dental school, he went on to earn a degree in viticulture at the University of California at Davis and worked part-time for a master California winemaker. After an extended tour in France and Portugal, working at several wineries, he arrived for the first time in Oregon with a theory about growing grapes and 3,000 grape cuttings. Quoting from an article written by David, grape growing in Western Oregon is an adventure. Like any real adventure, it is fraught with risk and peril, but can be richly rewarding, spiritually if not financially. <laughs> David go goes on to say that climate constitutes the risk, but I suspect that the projected growth of Yamhill County, one of the fastest growing counties in Oregon, also brings new controversy and challenge to the grape growing industry. David is here to tell us more about this adventure and challenge. Please join me in welcoming David Lett to the City Club. Thank you, Patty. I think you just gave most of my speech for me. Thanks. That's good. I'd like to thank Vivian Solomon for inviting me here today and all of you for having me here today. It's quite an honor for a country boy to come up here to the big city every once in a while. The history of grape growing and winemaking in Oregon, at least until the early 60s, is a bit obscure. I recall reading some documents of the Oregon Historical Society a number of years ago, which said that prior to Prohibition, there were 5,000 acres of grapes in the Willamette Valley. I think that must have been a misprint. It could have been more, it couldn't have been more than 500, because there was never really any serious grape growing or winemaking industry here. Nothing really took root until, um, the early, the early 60s, mid-60s. We know that there was a vineyard and winery in the late 1800s just outside of uh, Forest Grove on David Hill. This land was resurrected in the 70s and another winery started there. There was also old Hugo Newman's Willamette Valley Winery outside of Philomath. Hugo had quite a reputation for supplying student connoisseurs at Oregon State University during Prohibition. <clears throat> I have some of his old labels at my winery. They include such delicacies as Oregon White Niagara, which is a native East Coast variety, Oregon Cherry Wine, and Oregon Substandard Prune Wine. <laughs> that must have been a real marketing coup, eh? <laughs> Actually, most of Oregon's wine production until the 1970s was fruit and berry wine, and for a very good reason. The Willamette Valley produces some of the most flavorful tree fruit. I'm gonna flavorful tree fruit, and berries in the world, which is exactly why I chose this place to grow grapes. The true history of the European wine grape industry had its beginnings in Douglas County in 1962 with the planting of Hillcrest Vineyards. Since that time, wine grapes have spread throughout the state with a few more plantings in southern Oregon and a rather large planting in eastern Oregon, which I understand is going back to alfalfa after the winter kill of 1991. The focus of Oregon wine growing, however, has been in the cool Willamette Valley. The Willamette Valley, and in particular, Yamhill and Washington counties. This valley accounted for 85% of all of the grapes crushed in Oregon in 1991. 53% of those grapes came from Yamhill and Washington counties, and 34% of those from Yamhill County. Enough statistics. No, more. The value of harvested grapes in the 1991 vintage has been placed at just over eight and a quarter million dollars. 
A minimum FOB winery price for the wine produced from those grapes has been estimated at about $30 million. If you add the economic value to the state in terms of tourists attracted to the beauty of the wine country and support industries from equipment dealers to hotels and restaurants and truck drivers to printers, the value of the current wine industry in the state is probably around $100 million. And this was an agricultural industry that didn't exist here 30 years ago. But back to basics, and I'll repeat some of what Patty said. It was in Yamhill County that my wife and I first planted, planted the first vinifera vineyard in the Willamette Valley, the Irie Vineyards. The history of Willamette Valley viticulture then essentially began at the Irie Vineyards in 1966. But my reasons for coming to Oregon to plant European wine grapes goes back a bit further. I read a quote from Thoreau many years ago, which has sustained me throughout this adventure of establishing our vineyards and winery. If a man proceeds confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in the common hours. I'd like to tell you how that quote has sustained us at the Irie Vineyards, beginning with some of the common hours and leading to some of our successes along with some twists and fate and luck. Actually, my life has taken many curious turns. The day I was born, I believe my grandfather, who helped deliver me, stamped doctor on my forehead <laughs> right after he slapped my butt, or maybe the other way around, I'm not sure. In any event, I was the first male progeny born to the Russell side of the family, and that was, that was the days when girls couldn't be doctors, so I was chosen to be a doctor, and there was never any question that I would be a doctor until all 12 of the medical schools I applied to rejected me. <laughs> So what do you do with a degree in philosophy and pre-medicine? Pretty useless combination. The logical thing was to apply to dental school. And as Patty alluded to, I was having an interview at a dental school in, in San Francisco. Donner Pass was closed, and I drove up to the Napa Valley. And there, the white light hit me, the romance of winemaking. But I also learned about the viticulture and enology program, which is grape growing and winemaking, at the University of California. So I applied to Davis, and they accepted me. During my two years at Davis, leading to a, another bachelor's degree, this one in viticulture, I was introduced to Pinot Noir, the wine which you are, is on your tables today. This was a wine unknown to me during my upbringing in Utah, <laughs> for obvious reasons. In Utah, Thunderbird was sort of the, was then sort of the, the king of wines. It was uh, aperitif wine, dinner wine, dessert wine, all-purpose wine. <laughs> But I was in Salt Lake a month ago, and, I under and I, I've noticed, I did a little market research, they've upgraded, it's White Zinfandel now. <laughs> Not knocking anyone who likes White Zinfandel, I just prefer Pinot Noir. My first taste of French Burgundy, which is Pinot Noir, at Davis was a revelation. To me, this was what wine was all about, and that's why I was there. And I began to focus my attention on this variety, tasting all I could get my tongue around. The differences between the French and the Californian versions were, of Pinot Noir were incredible. The French had the decided edge in complexity, finesse, and flavor, but why? I've been taught that California wines were all things to all people, that all varieties do well in the warm California climate. Maybe so, but not Pinot Noir in my book by that time. This was reinforced by an enology professor who said during a lecture one day, there are few, if any, climates in California cool enough for the Pinot Noir grape. I decided that the key was not winemaking technology. The answer had to be in the raw material, the grape itself, and the climate in which the vine's grown. So I began to study the climate of Burgundy and to try to match it to other regions of the world. I looked at the South Island of New Zealand, the Mingo region of northern Portugal, but my thoughts always kept coming back to the Willamette Valley. Upon graduation from Davis in 64, I sailed off for Europe with letters of introduction and, a lots, uh, and lots of questions. The secret I discovered in Europe was really no secret at all. It had evolved <coughs> pardon me, over the past 10 to 15 centuries of grape growing in Europe. Grape, farm, grape growers are farmers, and farmers don't normally go looking for more trouble than nature always provides. This perverse bunch of European grape growers, however, kept growing certain varieties in regions where grape maturity is in doubt almost every year. Why? The secret is that when grape maturity coincides with the very end of a cool growing season, the wines made from them are the best the variety can produce. They have the most flavor. 
By the way, this is the same secret again, which gives the Willamette Valley the most flavorful fruits, nuts, and berries in the United States, possibly the world. A little chauvinism thrown in there. But with this revelation confirming my Davis theories, I returned to California and gathered the 3,000 cuttings of Pinot Noir and related varieties and moved north to the Willamette Valley to grow the great American Pinot Noir. In the retrospect of 27 years, this was a decidedly stupid thing to do. <coughs> I'd never even visited Oregon. I'd read about it in the National Geographic. <laughs> I joined the Coast Guard because I read an article about, the, about it in the National Geographic. Strange. But when you're a 25-year-old idealist with a well-nurtured theory, the thought of failure just doesn't register. Thoreau's words and my theory were the only things that were necessary. But then came reality. When I arrived in the Willamette Valley in January of 65, those of you were, who were here will remember it was a lake, a wash under some of the worst flooding in history. I hadn't read about this in the weather records. And since I found out, as all natives, since then I found out, as all natives here know, there is no typical weather in Oregon. But I was in Oregon now, and there was no turning back. I settled in Silverton and <clears throat> found, found a small plot of ground to plant the grape cuttings in let them root for the two years while I search for the ideal piece of vineyard land. In order to pay the rent and quell the rising specter of hunger, I took a job at a berry nursery in Salem, bundling rootings for 75 cents an hour with two college degrees. That shows you what college does for you. <laughs> By spring, I was promoted to tractor driver at a dollar and a quarter an hour. <laughs> while this was a great promotion, I knew it wasn't going to pay for the, uh, the project. Then luck intervened again. A job selling college textbooks became available. This job was great. Not great money, but it gave me an academic year to work, so I had summers free to work the vineyards. But in 1966, I had still found no vineyard site. For, for almost two years, I had searched the Willamette Valley for the perfect site. The Dundee Hills had attracted me from the beginning, but I rejected them again and again, because at that time there was no land use planning in the state, and the subdivisions were beginning to slurb all over the so-called view land outside of Newburgh and Dundee. Excellent potential vineyard land was available there, but it seemed only a matter of time, a short time in the life of a vineyard, which can live up to 100 years and more, before it would be overrun by houses. But in August of 66, I heard about a 20-acre site near Dundee, and it was letter perfect. It's what I had been looking for for the previous two years. I just blocked from my mind the subdivisions three miles away and brashly bought it, concluding that the value of hillside grape land would eventually be greater than view land for houses. That was brash, wasn't it? Not necessarily. There's a, a vineyard going into a very low-density residential zone development right outside of Dundee now. Kind of heartening. In essence, what I did was draw the Pinot line there, hoping that it would last longer than Francis Maginot line. And today, the subdivisions are still three miles away, thanks to good land use planning. Actually, we do have a French Pinot line in the Dundee Hills now in the form of a winery and vineyard owned by Robert Drouin. A, Bur a Burgundian producer. Duran's attention was directed toward Oregon in 1980, when in a blind tasting in Burgundy, one of our wines came in second against an impressive array of his own wines. Robert is convinced that Oregon is the only place in the world besides Burgundy where Pinot Noir belongs. He's so convinced that he's put an estimated 10 to 12 million dollars into this Oregon project. Of course, when you realize that the price of an acre of prime vineyard land in Burgundy can cost around one million dollars, the Dundee Hills must have looked very attractive. With our land use, without our land use laws, this venture never would have been possible. Land use planning has slowed the process, sometimes called growth, that might have covered some of our best potential land with asphalt and houses by now. The challenge will be how we deal with future growth and the pressures to change current land use law in the next 10 years especially. Urban areas show an eagerness to expand their urban growth boundaries, the subject of next week's meeting, and so-called secondary lands have been a hot topic lately, with continual requests to allow more and more non-agricultural uses on agricultural lands. These two issues have a lot to do with the future of the Oregon wine industry and agriculture in general. To gain a proper perspective, it's necessary to have an overall concept of land use planning. It's a bit like looking into your wallet to see how much money you have before you deciding where to spend it. Good land use planning involves having an idea of how much land is necessary for the various needs of the community, commercial areas, residential areas, industrial areas, forest and the farmlands necessary to provide food. Another important element is the existence of public lands for recreation. 
Oregon's land use laws have played an important part in helping differentiate Oregon from other states and have indeed helped form the identity of Oregon as a place where natural resources are treated with a certain amount of respect. No wonder we had 88,000 people move here last year. I believe that's the figure. But this picture of Oregon is changing. Everybody still wants to own their own home, if not a five-acre plot, at least a 5,000-square-foot lot. There simply is not the land capacity for this to happen unless we shortchange ourselves by taking open spaces, forest farmlands away from their current use. The result could likely be a sea of what we're already seeing, apartment complexes, shopping malls, and video stores. A sea nothing like the green we have come to associate with the beauty of Oregon. In order to preserve those agricultural and public use areas, people will have to make the trade-off of living closer together in those areas already dedicated to urban use. Not something most people want to do, and thus you see the pressures counties are under to allow zone changes detrimental to forest and farmland. As for the issue of secondary lands, I might mention that in 1974, when Yamhill County was putting together its first comprehensive plan, the hillsides in that county were considered secondary lands, and therefore the place for the subdivisions of the future to go. Dave Adelsheim and Dick Erath, both winery owners now, and I almost camped out in the planning department office for months. And we managed to convince them that this, there was a wonderful potential for a heretofore unknown crop in, in Oregon. And the planning department there had the foresight to save those hills for viticulture. As population mounts in Oregon, vision such as I just described has to be reinforced, not weakened by our legislators and county commissioners and planners. It's a little appalling, however, to realize that LCDC has a budget of $7 million, while Economic Development's budget is $228 million, and the Department of Transportation is almost $1.1 billion. We won't go into the joke about what's, what's orange and sleeps for comfortably, unless you want to talk to me afterwards. <clears throat> it's even more disturbing to look at the political contribution expenditure reports, both in Oregon and nationally, and realize that in many cases, contributions from development interests provide a large share, if not a majority, of local campaign contributions. Oregon agriculture as we know it is in trouble from these special interests, but the potential of Willamette Valley agriculture, not just viticulture, is immense. I've heard berry growers, walnut farmers, and orchardists say, we just can't compete with California. Well, if we're talking about growing huge tonnages of perfectly shaped, totally flavorless strawberries, no, we can't. But properly marketed, and I, I must emphasize that, properly marketed, our agriculture of flavor can be even more of a mainstay of the Oregon economy than it has been for the past 150 years. Our green hillsides and our valley floors and our woodlands also attract tourists, and tourism has become the state's third largest income producer. I might mention agriculture is first. The Willamette Valley is beautiful and therefore attractive to tourists because of agriculture. Our neighboring states, Washington, Washington to the north and Baja, Oregon to the south, have shown us what we will look like if we allow our land use laws to be weakened. We need to draw another line, a line against uncontrolled growth. We need to see ourselves as what we are, the last frontier. Oregonians have to have the vision to realize that this is it, because we can no longer enjoy the prerogative that our forebears had, and that's cut and move west, because the end of west is 50 miles from here, and it's the ocean. We also need to realize that an increasing population needs to be fed, not housed on top of some of the world's finest agricultural land. Oregon's a unique place, but it's also a fragile place. We can grow and still retain much of what we have in the terms of quality of life, but this growth has to be done with restraint and with wisdom and respect for what we leave to future generations. The mechanism to do this is in place now. Our land use laws are the most innovative, and I'd like to say that, be able to say that they are the most effective in the country. Indeed, they are the model for the more progressive states and even some foreign countries. No innovations or radical adjustments are necessary. The laws are in place. They need to be respected and strengthened. This, like planting a vineyard here 27 years ago, may seem to be the impossible dream, but Thoreau, I, Thoreau and I don't believe in those kind of dreams. The dream I'm talking about is quite possible for Oregon. Well, since I'm beginning to sound like a politician, I guess I'd best stop now. Thank you again for the privilege of speaking with you.
Thank you, David. And I would like to also say thank you for this wonderful wine that we're enjoying. I know all of you out there in Radio Land. Those of you in Radio Land and watching this on cable won't be able to appreciate that nearly as much as we have today. I'd like to ask Vivian Solomon for the first question. David, you've just given us uh, an enlightening view of Oregon's land use laws. I'd like to ask you to tell us what you would do to strengthen those laws. Well, first of all, I think I, ideally I would probably eliminate secondary lands completely in the Willamette Valley. <laughs> I'm, and I'm not representing any particular group when I say that. I'm representing my own, my own uh, feelings on that matter. I just saw, to give you an example, I saw a set of overlays the other day in, in, of Lane County. These are transparencies showing, first, the urban growth boundaries existing now. Next, the, uh, <coughs> what do you call them? Exception areas, overlaid. These are areas that account for about 800,000 acres in the Willamette Valley already. These are exception areas outside of, of zoning that were established prior to zoning. And you overlay that, the new plan for secondary lands in Lane County begins to look like Orange County. And this just can't happen here. What has to happen, I think, to get down to reality is that people have to organize on the local level. They have to elect representatives to the legislature who are pro-Oregon not pro-special interest, and we have to see that same thing happening in, in, in the local, area, local areas also with county commissioners and planning, planning commissions. That answer it partially? I could go on for four or five hours, but... <laughs> Our next question is by Chuck Shattuck. And then uh, please line up at the microphone. Uh, we blame El Nino for everything today, and obviously there is an effect on agriculture, particularly in the Northwest at this time. Uh, what is the effect of the drought as we now see it uh, on your product, and uh, also in the neighboring states, and what is this, what if this continues will be the effect on growing grapes in this area? Well, if it continues, I suppose we'll look like the Sahara Desert, but uh We've, we've survived drought, drought years before. It, uh, this year looks, as, as you mentioned, it looks like it's going to be a very bad one. Grapevines tend to be very deeply rooted, so they're going after moisture, and they can stand a great deal of moisture stress. It shouldn't affect our crop at all. It's going to affect irrigated crops if there's no irrigation water and so on. Paul Milius, uh, club member. Um, what would you recommend in the way of changes in business law, taxation, and so on to assist uh, and strengthen the Oregon wine industry? Do I have to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can answer that. That's not in my, my field, really. I'm sorry. Mary McCarthy. Um, Oregon has no winery cooperatives. Do you think that a winery cooperative would be good for Oregon, and why or why not? I think a winery cooperative is probably going to be absolutely necessary for Oregon. The prediction is at this point that this year's harvest, 1992, will probably see an excess just of Pinot Noir grapes of 1,000 tons. 1,000 tons converts to an awful lot of gallons of wine. And there is really no home for a lot of, a lot of these tons of grapes. So a cooperative winery which might go back to the business question again, if someone wanted to get in the business of owning a cooperative winery, could produce Oregon wines with an economy of scale that most wineries can't have now. Most of the wineries in Oregon are like Burgundian wineries. They're small, they're family run, and the, the economies of scale just aren't there. If you can get a large cooperative winery, the price of Oregon wines could go down, and it would be a good marketing advantage for Oregon. I think it's a necessity. Not quite sure how to implement it yet, but I think it's necessary. Bill Crane, City Club member. Um, in the past few years, we've seen an increase of government uh, required labeling on wines and warnings about alcohol abuse. While these labels and warnings may have a positive effect on human health, 
Um, what, you, what could you tell us about the effect they've had on the wine industry? How many hours do you have? <laughs> That's a three-minute question. Okay. <laughs> there is a certain amount of neo-prohibitionism going on in the United States now. We found out 50 years ago that prohibition does not work overtly, so they're coming in through the back door now, hitting the alcohol industry from every direction they can, and that's mainly by scare tactics. We have a sulfite warning label on wine. 0.2% of the population is allergic to sulfites. 15% of the population are allergic to milk products. Do we have a warning label on milk? No. These warning labels, such as, I've forgotten how it reads, what is it, don't operate heavy equipment while drunk and trying to get pregnant, I can't remember. <coughs> <laughs> These warning labels have had an effect on a certain amount of the alcohol-consuming public. I tend to like to see wine as a different medium than alcohol in general. However, it's categorized along with all other alcohols by the federal government. Anytime the word alcohol is used in a federal document, it has to be associated with drugs, thus making me the equivalent of a street dealer in drugs, and I'm in a legal business. It has had an influence. I think it's cyclical. I think Americans will come to their senses finally when they find out that uh, every time they turn on the TV or open the, open the newspaper, they find out there's one more thing they can't ingest. Pretty soon, we can't eat anything, we can't drink anything. I think it'll come around again. My name is Leslie Hildula, and I'm on the Business and Labor Committee. And I have a question regarding labor. What kind of changes have you seen since you've been operating uh, a vineyard and a winery in Oregon in the labor and the people who actually work in the industry? The wine industry uh, <clears throat> is not a large employer, per se. A winery does not employ a, a large number of people. There's a winemaker and there's cellar rats, as they're called. Um, but in terms of vineyards, we've seen a huge expansion of vineyards in the state of Oregon. And the people working in these vineyards primarily, it's very difficult to find people at the unemployment offices who are willing to do some of the intensive labor that vineyards require. So a lot of it, a lot of that labor is dependent upon migrant workers to the state of Oregon and has provided a lot of jobs for them in, in between other traditional crops that have been grown here. That answer? Sort of? That's what I'm. The impact for me of increasing numbers of, of Mexican workers here has not been profound because I've had a couple of guys work, Mexican fellows who have worked for me for the past seven years who are sort of the mainstay of my vineyard and they managed to hire other people, legal too. They have green cards. <coughs> and our crew only with 46 acres of vineyards amounts to about at max well, no, during harvest we'll have 16 people, but during the year we'll provide for about six to eight jobs. I have a two-part question, Gretchen Beener, City Club member. First of all, with the plethora of, of new wineries that have opened up over the last 15 years or so, I'd be interested in how that has impacted um, how you do business as a winery, number one. And number two, uh, we see more and more different varietals, not just Pinot Noir or Riesling grapes. And how is that changing given um, the changes in the wine business? First part, <coughs> I have a lot more competition now with 87 wineries here instead of none. I think it's kind of nice to see that, the increase in wineries. An interesting figure I just came up with yesterday was that in the last, since 1986, 1986 to 1991, half of the wineries in the state of Oregon were created. In the previous 14 years were the other half. Kind of interesting. A lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon. It does create more competition, but it also, Oregon produces some fairly unique wines, and I think there's properly marketed again, uh, there's a huge potential for them, for all of us. In terms of other varietals, I presume you might be alluding to Pinot Gris, which is a variety that we were the first winery to produce in the United States. It's become an amazingly successful variety for Oregon. California, those surfer twits down there are calling me up. <laughs> and <laughs> calling me up and picking my brain about Pinot Gris, and I simply say, look, this doesn't fit the theory. Pinot doesn't belong in California. And they say, Pinot Noir, too? And I say, yeah. 
Uh, those new varietals will probably see things like Riesling, which you mentioned fading out of the picture. Riesling is a large producer. Pinot Gris is not, but uh, the market for Riesling is beginning to pick up again, but it has been pretty dismal. The limiting factor here is the marginal climate that we have in the Willamette Valley. There are certain, we can't grow everything here. We can grow early maturing varieties only. These varieties fall into a thing called period one varieties, which I will certainly not bore you with, but they're early maturing varieties. We're not able to really successfully grow Zinfandel, Petit Zara, things like that. We're fairly limited. But what we do grow here tastes good. Chris Smith, club member, uh, you mentioned that your first exposure to the wine industry was in uh, the Napa Valley, and I've read a little Utah. bit. In Utah, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Well, I've, I've read a little bit about the land use issues uh, in the Napa Valley, and as I understand it, not only is urban growth a problem there, but tourism as well. Um, uh, my question again is two part is, is tourism a factor in our land growth or land use issues for the wine industry here in Oregon? Uh, and are there lessons we can learn from what has happened or is happening uh, in the Napa Valley? I'm sure there are lessons we can learn from the Napa Valley, but if you look at the Willamette Valley as opposed to the Napa Valley, you see a much larger land surface. I think we can absorb a lot more tourists than they can comfortably do in the Napa Valley. The Napa Valley is terrible on a weekend in the summer. It's just impossible. I don't know why anyone would even go there. But if we're looking at the Willamette Valley, which is 120 miles long and, what, 50, 60 miles wide, we're able to disperse the wine tourists pretty easily doing that. So the issues are not, we don't have to confront the same issues that Napa Valley is confronting right now. Andrew Wheeler, <coughs> regarding the um, warnings and the, and the government and so forth, I, I think that there might be another category which would be encouragement because we hear that the French uh, don't have heart problems because they drink a lot of red wine and th at the same time consume a lot of dairy product. It's kind of a, it, it sort of sounds like that uh, wine, in, in a sense, is a, is a rotor rooter. Uh, <laughs> could you comment on that? Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> Uh, the French paradox that you uh, refer to was on 60 Minutes uh, last year, just in December, I believe. If you look at a bar graph of wine sales, of red wine sales in November, I believe 60 Minutes was in December, the bar graph is about a half an inch high in November and it's about four inches high in December. Because this paradox is strange, yes, the fatty foods, pate, uh, cheeses, most of the dairy products in France are ingested in terms of cheese. I mean, how many? 300 and some odd varieties of cheese that de Gaulle talked about. And it is a paradox, but apparently there's something in red wine that reduces the, reduces the cholesterol, which can be the artery clogger. And I forgot to wear my little heart symbol today that says, have you had your glass of red wine today? But I think most of you have anyway. Uh, that program has done a great deal. I mean, just there are now tabloids, and I saw in Safeway yesterday, where red wine prevents arthritis, gout, God knows what. But <clears throat> I think we'll stick to what the medical evidence shows us. Barbara Bailey, farmer and relatively new uh, club member, bringing diversity to the city club. I um, would like to ask you to comment on the secondary lands. I have been operating under um, the impression that secondary lands uh, would make a step toward preserving the truly prime egg lands. That's the argument that has been uh, coming out in our county. Uh, could you comment on that? I could. <laughs> <laughs> Please. As I pointed out earlier on today, <laughs> secondary lands in 1974 were where we're growing vineyards right now. and. The other th point I tried to make in this discussion is that agriculture in Oregon has not even begun to be tapped for its potential. So when, when there are these ill-conceived plans about what, what constitutes a secondary land now, secondary land is a mess. I mean, there's no definition. LCDC's definitions are such a quagmire that they can't be applied consistently to every county. We need to have simple definitions of secondary land that people can understand and implement. But until we do that, just willy-nilly, as in this overlay I, sh I 
discussed about Lane County, saying that's a secondary land, that's a secondary land, using very obscure criteria just can't happen. Otherwise, we're going to lose it before we come to our senses. In essence, to summarize, the secondary lands of 1992 can be profitable agriculture lands of 2002, 2022. Ray Polanyi, a City Club member, uh, Mr. Lett. Uh, I was delighted to hear you mention three different budgets, the LCDC budget, the Economic Development budget, and the Department of Transportation budget. You mentioned $1 billion on the Department of Transportation. I think the problem is that there's also a provision in our Constitution that mandates that the Department of Transportation shall spend all the money on highways. Um, given the connection between land use and uh, transportation, uh, would you favor, in fact, would you recommend that the people in Oregon be allowed to revisit that constitutional restriction and allow the possibility of using this tremendous amount of money also to rebuild a different transportation that is purely highways. And I'm thinking of rails and buses, uh, both in the cities and in between the cities. Do you think there is a connection? Do you, would you favor a change? Uh, do you know the answer to that question? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I hope I know the answer. I, I was not aware that it was constitutionally mandated. There that is the a restriction that says Amazing. all the money collected from gas taxes and registration fees shall be spent on highways only. That's no it. wonder. Yeah, no wonder. I can see, uh, you know, even from McMinnville, Oregon to Portland, the traffic on Highway 99 is horrible, so they want to build a bypass. And at one point they were talking about putting the bypass right through the vineyards in the Dundee Hills. That was one of their alternatives. Why not use light rail from McMinnville to Portland? Why not use the existing uh, Southern Pacific Line, which happens exactly. to be for sale at one-tenth of the price? Maybe. Exactly. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Liberty and your guest, David. Uh, first, let me compliment you on your taste in ties. You too, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, uh, unlike all but a very few number of people active in land use in the state, you've had a chance to observe one county's uh, implementation of the state's land use laws for over two decades. Do you see any change? for the better or for the worse in the quality of decision making that affects you and which affects our future with respect to the protection of our farm and forest lands. You want to get me in a whole bunch of trouble down in Yamhill County here, Robert? I haven't seen a great deal of, of change. Um, as I alluded to, the planners uh, back in 1974 did lock up some of what were considered secondary lands for vineyard sites. I mean, these became EFU zones instead of, instead of uh, the LDR zones. The problem on the local level is that uh, special interest groups often, and I'm not speaking just of Yamhill County, but special interest groups often have the sway. And the people who, who know that they're right and the land ought to be preserved for agriculture aren't vocal. They need to get out and start putting the fear of God into county commissioners and planners, at least the fear of the voting populace, so that we can start turning things around so the peop the, our elected officials understand that there is a populace out there that gives a darn about Oregon and retaining Oregon's agricultural economy. Thank that you. answer, Marshall? That's a full answer as far as I'm concerned. All right. Uh, my name is Frank Parisi. Uh, David, I have two questions. First of all, where are uh, Oregon wines sold and where are Irie wines sold? In, I know they're sold in Oregon, but are they sold around the world or just in the United States? And my, my second question is, um, uh, are you suggesting that the whole Willamette Valley is capable of becoming a wine growing region? And uh, if not, where do, you, where do you think the potential is? The first part, to answer the first part of your question, most Oregon wines, I can't remember the statistics, I just read it the other day, but I think something like 80% or 85% of Oregon wines are sold within the state of Oregon. Irie has been around for a long time, as have a num number of others. 
<coughs> and so we have national and, and international distribution. We're sold in, in um, England and possibly soon Germany and even France and even Switzerland. It's tough. The problem is what's happened to the wine industry in general, not just in Oregon in the past, since 1970 when the boom began, is that the number of wineries has almost quadrupled while the number of distributors has been cut in half. So for a new winery coming online to try to find distribution nationally is darned hard. The second part of your question, uh, the Willamette Valley in general, no, will not support grapes everywhere. <coughs> it supports a number of other nice crops, but not grapes. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the Willamette Valley is very specialized in terms of where grapes will grow. Because this is a marginal climate and the grapes just barely get ripe at the end of the growing season, you have to have everything on your side in terms of elevation, slope, exposure to the sun, and so on. So this limits where grapes can be planted in Oregon. And also, what, what it will do is eventually sort out the way Burgundy is sorted out. If you go down what's called the Cote d'Or, which is a how many miles? 40 miles long. Different elevations, different exposures, different slopes are rated differently in terms of the quality of wine they produce. This will sort out in Oregon eventually. The best vineyard sites are going to produce the best wines, properly managed and properly made. The marginal sites will produce marginal wines. Those lands will be cheaper. Maybe the other ones will be worth a million dollars an acre someday, like Burgundy. I have no idea. David, I have a question. In reading the background information, I think you also alluded to it in your remarks, you talked about the competition that uh, your wine came in second to uh, in a uh, competition amongst the great French wines. Could you maybe enlighten us a little bit in terms of what kinds of, of competitions these, these are for wines and how Oregon wines are faring in general uh, with respect to the rest of the wines? Sure. Well, this particular competition that we were in was kind of a fluke. It was uh, conducted, the first one was in 1979, and I sent wines to the French magazine Gomio, which is sort of the equivalent of Gourmet magazine in France. And they did a tasting that <coughs> where some foreign wines, including ours, did pretty well against some French burgundies. And Monsieur Drouin decided that if the proper burgundies had been represented, that the foreigners would not have done so well. So he called a rematch. I didn't even know what was going on until I got a telegram from a friend in Burgundy saying, you play second. And that really sort of started things for the Willamette Valley in terms of recognition. Since that time, we've had tastings, a number of different wineries have had tastings, pitting our wines against Burgundy's. And you must understand that French Burgundy's, if the, if the land's costing a million bucks an acre, these wines cost a little bit too. So French Burgundy's are often around 80 or $90 a bottle or more. A case of Romani Conti can go, that's 12 bottles, can go for around $6,000. Um, we find that our Oregon wines, certain Oregon wines, not all Oregon wines, but certain Oregon wines can consistently compete with French Burgundies at two to three times the price. That's both white and red Burgundies. White Burgundies are traditionally made from Chardonnay. Other competitions, the standard competitions, almost every city and every state has various wine competitions. Oregon wines generally do pretty darn well in them. The problem is that most wine tasters, and I've done a lot of tastings on, and judgings myself, most wine tasters, by the time you're through tasting 100 wines during the day, or even in the middle of tasting 100 wines, spitting them out, your palate begins to go for the obvious. And what we produce in terms of our best wines in Oregon, I think, in terms of Pinot Noir, are more subtle wines. So they often get overlooked for the more obvious Pinot Noirs that are big and come out and slap you around the head and ears and announce themselves. And they're sort of wines you want to wrestle with instead of dance with. I prefer dancing with wines. Rex Armstrong, City Club member. Is anyone in California producing a Pinot Noir that you consider to be acceptable? <laughs> Fifth Amendment. Yes, there are some Pinot Noirs produced in California that are quite acceptable, but they're totally different kinds of wines than Oregon Pinot Noirs or French Pinot Noirs. Uh, I don't have it here. <coughs> the coolest regions of California, such as Carneros, are much, much warmer than the Willamette Valley. The style of wines is totally different. 
they tend to lose their varietal identity. They're wonderful wines. They taste good, smell good, look good. They just don't have all those components that you can get by having the wine growing in the right cool climate. To answer your question, I think Saintsbury secretly imports Oregon grapes. I like their wines. <laughs> David, thanks very much for sharing your remarks with respect to wine and also land use in Oregon. And again, thank you for this wonderful wine. I think uh, you come in a very, very uh, far and away first for us with our tasting today. And with that, we are adjourned.